السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الأمين and welcome to the mothers of the believers and if you remember we spent a number of episodes talking about the life of Aisha رضي الله عنها her relationship with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and her place in Islam and we had promised that for this episode we're going to speak about one of the mothers of the believers the one that Aisha رضي الله عنها said she was the one that was like my match or the one that was my equal from all the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. We're talking about Hafsa, the daughter of Umar ibn Khattab. So stay tuned, we'll begin insha'Allah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillahi Alameen. Welcome to the Mothers of the Believers. Today we're starting to talk about Hafsa, the daughter of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Hafsa radiallahu anha was born five years before the Quraysh started to rebuild the Kaaba. This is according to her father, Umar ibn al-Khattab. So she was born five years before the Quraysh started to rebuild the Kaaba. And she was brought up in an Islamic environment from an, from her like early age because both her parents and her aunts and her uncles had become Muslim. So a huge number of her family members were Muslim. It is said that you, sh you can actually count seven members from her family, from her close family, who had witnessed the Battle of Badr. And as you know, the Battle of Badr, those who witness it, they have a special place, a very special place. And it, so it's a great honor. So seven members from her family member were the people who had witnessed the Battle of Badr. Now before the Prophet وسلم, as with almost all the wives of the Prophet وسلم, she was married to someone else before and she was married to Khunais ibn Hudhafa ibn Qais. So this man Khunais radiallahu anhu, he accepted Islam through the da'wah and through the efforts of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And when Khunais became a Muslim, the Quraysh were very angered by that and he faced oppression and cruelty from the Quraysh. And so he migrated to Abyssinia. He had the honor of being part of this first migration all the way to Al-Habasha, to Abyssinia. But when he got there, he became homesick. He wanted to come back to Mecca so he could not completely settle, settle there and he returned. Now when he returned to Mecca, uh, a, a little bit after that, the call to migrate to al Medina came. And so now he became honored of being the people who made the two migrations. And he migrated this time, though, with his wife Hafsa, the daughter of Umar radiallahu anha. And Khunais and Hafsa radiallahu anhum, they lived a good life in Medina. Hafsa would memorize the ayat of the Quran as they were revealed. She would devote time to giving deep thought and attention to the meanings of the Quran. Meanwhile, Khunais, her husband, he was improving his martial skills and getting prepared for battle. And so when it was time for the Battle of Badr, Khunais radiallahu anhu, he took part in the battle and he was wounded at Badr. Sometimes you may find books that say that he was um, wounded at Uhud, but actually he was wounded at Badr because the Prophet ﷺ married Hafsa before Uhud came. So in any case, he was wounded in the Battle of Badr and the Prophet ﷺ had stayed there for a while and when they came back, meaning stayed at the battlefield, when they came back, Hafsa radiallahu anh, she started to nurse him back to health, but within a few days he succumbed to his injuries and he passed away. So then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa buried Khunais radiallahu anhu in Al-Baqi' the famous Al-Baqi' basically very famous cemetery where all, a lot of the martyrs and the mothers, the believers were buried in Al-Baqi' so it's a great honor to be buried there in Medina. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi buried Khunais in Al-Baqi' and he led the prayer over him. Now, of course, Hafsa radiallahu anha was taken over by grief, but she, uh, the natural grief, and she began to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even more. And now Umar, her father radiallahu anhu, he wanted to find a good husband for his daughter. So she, it is said that she was about 18 years old at the time. Now, you remember we mentioned that Uthman radiallahu anhu, his wife Ruqayya, the daughter of the Prophet from Khadija, she had passed away at the time of Badr. So, Umar saw that you know, Uthman had no wife either 
And so he thought this would be an excellent match, that instead of my daughter staying without a husband, she will marry Uthman. Now another interesting thing, so that what happened here is that uh, he went, Uthman went, uh, or Umar went and asked Uthman, would you like to marry Hafsa? Now a number of things here. First you see that uh, Umar عنه, when he wanted to find a husband for his daughter, he actually asked his friend Uthman. He didn't go uh, necessarily to look for someone about the same age of Hafsa. The reason we're pointing this out is, as we mentioned when we were discussing Aisha عنها, age was not an issue to people. And that's why Umar, instead of looking for a young man who would be around 18 or 20, he asked his close friend Uthman if he would like to marry his daughter. Why? Because the most important thing they were looking, and he was looking for someone who was an excellent individual, a righteous man, and he found Uthman radiallahu anhu, who had just had his wife pass away, an excellent match. So why not? Age was not an issue back then. So in any case, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, the famous Abdullah ibn Umar, the, the scholar, the companion, he narrates that Hafsa's husband, Khunais ibn Hudafa, was one of the companions of the Prophet and he was those who were present at Badr and he died, he was after, from his injuries at Badr, but he died in Medina. So he narrates how Umar ibn Khattab said, I met Uthman ibn Affan and offered Hafsa to him in marriage. So he said, or, or Umar now narrating himself, he said, I said, if you wish, I will marry Hafsa bin to Umar to you. So I'll give you my daughter Hafsa. So Uthman said, I will think about it. In some other narrations, uh, Uthman said, I have no need for women at the moment. But in this narration, Uthman said, I'm going to think about it. And after several nights passed, he came back and he said to Umar, I don't think that I want to get married at this time. So then Umar went to someone else. And who do you think he went to? He went to another of his close friends, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. So Umar went to Abu Bakr. He says, narrates himself, he says, I met Abu Bakr and said, if you wish, I will marry Hafsa bint Umar to you. Abu Bakr kept quiet and did not give me any response. So Umar says, I was more upset with Abu Bakr than I was with Uthman. Because at least Uthman responded, but Abu Bakr didn't say anything. He was just quiet and he didn't respond. So then a few days passed and then the Prophet ﷺ proposed to her and I married her to him. This is the narration from Umar radiallahu anhu. Now, in, in, we'll, we'll look at some or a number of the other narrations where now here later on Abu Bakr comes to Umar and he said perhaps you were upset when you offered Hafsa in marriage to me and I didn't reply. So Umar says I said yes. So Abu Bakr said nothing prevented me from responding to your offer but the fact that I knew the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned her and I did not want to disclose the secret of the Prophet ﷺ. So here what's interesting is that uh, Abu Bakr knew the Prophet ﷺ wanted to marry Hafsa. He had mentioned her that he wanted to marry, sorry, that he wanted to marry, yes, Hafsa, the daughter of Umar. So Abu Bakr knew this, but it was a secret, so he didn't want to disclose the secret, and obviously he didn't want to lie. And, but then he said, if he ha had decided not to marry her, I would have accepted your offer. So if the Prophet ﷺ had refused, I would have immediately, or if he decided not to marry her, I would have accepted your offer to me. So this was um, basically uh, and the, the narration or kind of a summary of the different narrations. But like we said, he goes to his friends, Umar radiallahu anh, because uh, the, he knows that they're upstanding and righteous individuals and age was not an issue to them. Now the interesting thing is, in another narration, he complained to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The Prophet tells him, would you like an in-law for yourself that's better than Uthman? And would you like an in-law for Uthman, and I will tell Uthman, an in-law who is better than you. So what does that mean? But in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said that Hafsa will marry someone better than Uthman, and Uthman will marry someone better than Hafsa. Now we know Uthman married the daughter Umm Kulthum of the Prophet ﷺ, so the question to think about, now it's time for a break, think about this during the break. How come the Prophet ﷺ said that Umm Kulthum is better than Hafsa? And Hafsa is the mother of the believers. So how could she be better than the mother of the believers? Think about that until we come back from the break, inshallah. Hajj, the journey of Ibrahim alayhi salam. 
is geared as an educational documentary that will take the audience through the footsteps of Ibrahim and the Muslims today as they perform the once-in-a-lifetime journey of Hajj. The story is told by some of our well-known scholars of today as they reveal the importance and significance of the Muslim's Hajj and how it relates to the journey of the father of religions, Ibrahim. كل نفس ذائقة الموت وإنما توفون أجوركم يوم القيامة فمن زحزح عن النار وأدخل الجنة فقد فاز وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورُ All right, welcome back to the show. We were talking about, before the break, we were talking about the two different narrations where in one, the Prophet ﷺ told Umar, should I not show you a better in-law than Uthman? And that makes sense because here, if Hafsa marries Uthman, then Uthman will be the in-law. But if she marries the Prophet وسلم, then the Prophet will be the in-law. And he's a better in-law than Uthman. And then he said, and should I not show Uthman a better in-law than you? Because Uthman, if he marries Hafsa, Umar will be the in-law. But if he marries the daughter of the Prophet وسلم, the second daughter, because we said Ruqayya died after Badr, and now Umm Kulthum will be wed to Uthman. So if he marries Umm Kulthum, the daughter of the Prophet وسلم, from Khadija, then the Prophet ﷺ will be the in-law. So this narration is clear and it makes sense. But the other narration, the Prophet ﷺ said that Hafsa will marry someone better than Uthman, meaning the Prophet ﷺ. And Uthman will marry someone better than Hafsa, meaning he will marry Umm Kulthum, the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ. So Hafsa is the mother of the believers, one of the mothers of the believers. So is Umm Kulthum better than Hafsa? The, the answer, the scholars have a nice answer. They say it's that Better doesn't always mean better in religion and better in deen. It can be better in lineage or better in like family members or, or nobility. And no one will disagree that Umm Kulthum, the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, was better than Hafsa, meaning that she's the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ. So she has a better lineage, better family, no doubt. And so that's what it means here. So it doesn't mean better in religion necessarily. So the Prophet ﷺ then married Hafsa. And Umar was very, very pleased to be the in-law of the Prophet ﷺ. And Hafsa anha got the honor to join Sauda and Aisha and become one of the mothers of the believers anhun. This marriage is happened about in the third year after the Hijrah. And it is said that Hafsa anha was about the age of 22. And sometimes you'll see the age is always not always certain. So sometimes you'll say the age from anywhere from 18 to 22, or, or she died from this year to that year. You're going to see that a lot as we go along, inshallah, because the age wasn't always certain 100%. And sometimes there were different narrations. But inshallah, what we'll try to do is mention all the different narrations so we, we just have a rough idea of the time frame that we're talking about. But another interesting point here is that the Prophet ﷺ now, when he marries Hafsa, this wedding, it has in it a, an important social implication. We were saying earlier in the first episode that sometimes the marriages of the Prophet ﷺ, they will basically have a da'wah purpose in them. Some of them will have a humane purpose. It will be a widow who has no place to go. The Prophet ﷺ will marry her, as is the case with Sauda bin anha. But also sometimes it has a social implication. The Prophet ﷺ marries Aisha, as we said, that shows the place of Abu Bakr. The Prophet ﷺ marries Hafsa. It also shows the place of Umar. And the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ marries Uthman, or two daughters of the Prophet ﷺ, one after the other, they marry Uthman. And that shows the place of Uthman. And so you, the interesting thing, if you look at the four rightly guided Khulafa, every single one of them had a tie to the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Bakr and Umar, the Prophet ﷺ, he, they were in-laws to the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, Uthman and Ali, and both of them were son-in-laws, if you want to say, of the Prophet ﷺ. So there was a social implication, a social benefit that came out of the wedding from the, of the Prophet ﷺ to Hafsa anha. And uh, 
And after the marriage is when Abu Bakr and Uthman both, both uh, explained their positions that they had heard the Prophet ﷺ mention Hafsa and that's why they had kept quiet and Umar of course after that he was pleased. Now you will find a lot of interesting stories with Hafsa radiallahu anha and Aisha because as we said they were close to each other in age and they were kind of also close to each other in how they were thinking and like if you look at some other of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, there was some age difference between them. Some were younger, some were older. The ages were kind of a mix. But uh, Hafsa anha and Aisha, they became good friends. And so sometimes they would join forces against other wives of the Prophet ﷺ or join forces against the Prophet ﷺ. And as we said, you're going to see things that are, that are normal, that you'll see that they were human as well, even though they were extremely righteous and pious. But you see things that, that they were felt jealousy and they felt other things, which is just very, the, just the human side of everything. So, uh, this is a narration that's in the book of Bukhari, in the volume that talks, it deals with the tafsir, and the, it's specifically the tafsir of Surah Al-Tahreem, where Ibn Abbas says, I had intended to ask Umar, meaning Umar ibn Khattab, so I said, who were the two ladies who tried to back each other against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So Ibn Abbas said, I had far, hardly finished my speech when Umar said they were Aisha and Hafsa. And so basically the story is that after Asr, the Prophet ﷺ would visit his wives. And then uh, he would, like basically after Asr, he would spend a little time with each one of his wives. But he started to spend more time with Zainab bint Jahsh. And then they wanted to know what's going on. So Aisha, according to one of the narrations, and I'll try to give you uh, all all, of, all two or three narrations, just so we have an idea. Aisha spoke to Hafsa and Sauda, and they found out that a relative of Zainab bin Tujahsh had sent her some honey. And when the Prophet ﷺ would visit her, she would offer the honey to the Prophet ﷺ. So he would stay there a, lo a while longer because he would eat or from the honey. So then Aisha says, so Hafsa and I agreed secretly that if he comes to either of us, we would say, have you eaten Maghafir. Maghafir is basically, it's a kind of resin from a tree, but it has this foul odor to it. And so, she says, we did so. And the Prophet ﷺ said, no, I have not eaten maghafir, but I was drinking honey with Zainab bin Tujahsh, and I will never take it again. The full story is that Aisha, she knew that the Prophet ﷺ, he really hated any bad odor to come from him or from his mouth. He was very sensitive to these issues. So, she figured the way to make him and though, just to explain the whole reason they were doing this is that they didn't want, they loved to be with the Prophet ﷺ so much and this is just a normal and natural jealousy where that if the Prophet ﷺ spent longer time with Zainab bin Tujahsh, it took away from their time with, with him and so they wanted to find a way so the Prophet ﷺ would not spend a longer time with Zainab and eat from the honey. So they're trying to say the honey has a bad odor, the Prophet ﷺ hated things that had bad odor and that's the way they would stop him from eating the honey. So the Prophet ﷺ said, no, I was just drinking honey with Zainab bin Tujahsh. And then he says, I will never take it again. So I'm never going to eat this honey again. Now here, this is something that is halal. And now the Prophet ﷺ is, is saying that he's never going to touch it again. Now if this was an ordinary person, it would be okay. But the Prophet ﷺ, his actions, they become law. And this is a good food that he's now refusing it. And this is a food that he was eating and suddenly he, he's going to swear it off and never eat it again. It's a little different than when the Prophet ﷺ saw the companions eating lizard or like it's kind of like a, a huge kind of lizard in the desert. When he saw them eating the lizard, he was disgusted or he didn't want to eat it. He was not used to it. It was not common that in his region they would eat it. Now this is different. Now here this is something the Prophet ﷺ would eat and then he's going to swear it off. So then here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals ayat in the Qur'an. Ya ayyuhan nabiyyu lima tuharrimu ma ahallallahu lak tabtaghi mardata azwajik wallahu ghafoorun raheem. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebukes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, O oh Prophet, why do you forbid yourself that which Allah has allowed for you seeking to please your wives and Allah is most forgiving and most merciful. So here, this is basically uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealing this ayah because the Prophet said he's not going to consume from that honey anymore. And 
What we're going to do when we come back from the break, we're going to look at different narrations of the honey, just so that if you're reading at home, if you're reading in the future about the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, and you find different narrations, you're not absolutely startled. So we're going to cover all of them. And sometimes there's like a different benefit or different angle to each story. That when we come back from the break, inshallah. All right, welcome back to the show. And before the break, we were talking about the incident where the Prophet ﷺ was delayed at the house of Zainab bin Tujahsh, and the other wives didn't, came up with a plan to not have the Prophet ﷺ eat honey at the house of Zainab so they could spend more time with the Prophet ﷺ. So we took one narration. The other narration is that basically it mentions it that it happened in the house of Hafsa anha, that she was the one who was given this honey as a gift and that Aisha, Sauda, and Safiya عنهن, were the ones who agreed that if the Prophet ﷺ came to them, they would say you know, something similar, strange, have you eaten maghafir? The Prophet ﷺ then said no. And then he said, I only ate honey with Hafsa. And so then they said, well, it seems like those bees had, had gone to a tree, uh, like Al-Urfut it's called, that has, it's kind of a plant, but it has a foul odor if the bee like it takes nectar from that flower, it said that the smell even comes into the honey. That's how strong the smell is. So they said maybe you, the, 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 those bees that made that honey, they have touched the, like the plant of Al-Urfut and that's why the smell is there. So then the Prophet Sallam, that's when he said that he's not going to touch that honey anymore. But uh, this was just basically that how much love they had for the Prophet Sallam. And it was a normal household, you know, m normal household. They had these plans and ideas and ways and try to change the uh, opinion of the Prophet Sallam or try to change some behavior because of how much they loved him and how much uh, they all like sometimes competed or had natural jealousy that arises between human beings. But the main difference is that th they didn't let this jealousy lead them into doing things that were haram. And as I mentioned with Aisha radiallahu anha, a lot of times women will say, you know, I'm exactly like Aisha, I became jealous, I'm jealous. But you know, Aisha was jealous, but she also had many other qualities. So we want to take the good qualities, not just take only the jealousy. Um, even though she was jealous and she had a lot of jealousy, she was the one who prepared some, like Zainab bin Tujahsh when she was getting married to the Prophet Aisha prepared her for her wedding. So even though she was jealous, she had other characteristics. And that's why we, we look at the lives of the mothers of the believers so we can look at all like, of their other characteristics and hopefully emulate them, inshallah. So, in about the ninth year after the Hijrah, an event happened in which the wives of the Prophet ﷺ increased their stipend. A lot of wealth was now coming into the Muslims, a lot of gold dinars, a lot of like uh, cattle, livestock would come and the Prophet ﷺ would distribute all of it to the poor and would distribute it to the new Muslims to solidify their, their, their heart with Islam and he would come home empty-handed. And so when we describe the, the, the rooms in which the wives of the Prophet ﷺ lived in, you will see that they lived in really in, in very poor situations and they didn't have uh, like you know fancy homes, the rooms were extremely small, uh, that had you know, made mud of mud walls and they had very few or if any furniture in the rooms. So they started to ask for a little bit of, of increase in their stipend which is almost like the salary. 
and it's as if they put a little bit of pressure on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was angered with that and he stayed away from them for a month. Now we'll take the narration from the book of Bukhari. It's narrated again by Ibn Abbas. He said that for a whole year, I had wanted to ask Umar ibn Khattab about the explanation of a verse in Surah Al-Tahrim. But I couldn't ask him because I respected him very much. And of course, Umar, especially when he was given the responsibility of being the Khalifa, he became a lot, lot more serious uh, as an individual. So here Ibn Abbas, this great scholar, is saying that I couldn't go talk to him and ask him this question because of my respect for him. So he says, when we went to perform the Hajj, I also went along with him. And on the way back, while we were still on the way home, Umar went aside to answer the call of nature, meaning like to go to the bathroom by the Iraq trees. He says, I waited until he finished and then I proceeded with him and asked him, Ya Amir al Mu'mini, who were the two wives of the Prophet ﷺ who aided one another against him? And Umar immediately said, they were Hafsa and Aisha. Then I said to him, by Allah, I wanted to ask you about this a year ago but I could not do so owing to my respect for you. So he's being honest with him now. Now Umar said to him, do not refrain from asking me if you think that I have knowledge about a certain matter. If so, if you think so, then ask me. And if I know, I will tell you. So Umar is saying, when it comes to knowledge, you know, don't, don't refrain from asking me. Ask me any time. So then Umar starts to add to the story. He said, by Allah, in the period of Jahiliya, the pre-Islamic ignorance, we did not pay attention to women, uh, meaning we didn't give much care and attention to women, until Allah revealed about them what He revealed about them. And He assigned for them what He assigned. And then once, He says, I was thinking about a certain issue. And my wife said, I recommend that you do this and that. So then, so basically what's happening here is Umar radiallahu anhum, he was thinking about a certain issue, and then his wife suggested something to him. Why don't you do this or do that? So then he tells her, what have you got to do with this issue? It's basically, he's telling her, it's none of your business. He says, why do you poke your nose in a matter that I want to see fulfilled? So then his wife said to him, how strange you are, O son of Al-Khattab. You don't want to be argued with, while your daughter, Hafsa, she argues with the Prophet ﷺ so much that he remains angry for a full day. In other narrations, that she will not talk to him for a whole day. So then Umar he said he immediately put on his cloak, like an outer garment, and he went to Hafsa. Because now, this is a big deal that you argue with the Prophet ﷺ. This is the Prophet of Allah. So of course they're looking at it from the aspect of him being their husband ﷺ. But he's looking at it from the aspect of him being the Prophet ﷺ. So then he goes to Hafsa immediately, puts on his cloak, he goes to her. He says, my daughter, do you argue with the Prophet ﷺ so that he remains angry the whole day? And Hafsa said, yes, by Allah we argue with him. So then Umar said, he says, I warn you of Allah's punishment and the anger of uh, the Prophet And basically he tells her, do not be misled by the one who is proud of her beauty, meaning by Aisha, because she's beautiful, she's more beloved to the Prophet So don't think you can do what she's doing. The Prophet might tolerate her, but you might be divorced. So this is the excellent advice of the father to his daughter. But we're at the end of the episode, although we're in the middle of the story, we're going to have to finish it the next time, inshallah. So thank you for being an excellent audience. So Allahumma wa baraka ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.